some of it. Yeah. A lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, welcome, everyone. Please pardon my scratchy voice. I'm getting over a cold. Um, it's 10 o'clock, so welcome to the February 2nd, 2023 Government Operations Committee. And welcome to our returning members, and welcome to our older returning members <laughs> and brand new members. So thank you. It's great to have some new faces here. Um, I would comment, Amanda, that for the last year or so, I've heard all this talk about this being the best committee, and you know, and I've had my doubts, but I'm, I'm rethinking that. <clears throat> Glad to have you back, Rich. Glad yeah, to have. I know you've team. missed it. On you've the missed team. it. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well, we have quite a few things to go through today. So are there any changes to the agenda? Yes. Yeah, Lisa. Um, I uh, <clears throat> unfortunately need to pull the items for consideration under administration, the, the two resolutions. Um, um, let's see. Oh, the adoption of the local law? Yes. <coughs> We're, we're awaiting some further confirmation from <clears throat> the State Department of Labor before we can move ahead with that. Okay. All right. So resolution 11471 and 11472. We'll take those off. And maybe we'll see them next month. Yes. Any other changes? Um, you should have some papers that, that Jay Franklin passed out, um, including the email that he sent um, some details about assessments and also the um, administration and department goals of all the departments that um, report to GEO. So should have all that in paper. Are there any comments from the public? I don't see anyone. Um, let's go ahead and approve the minutes. Not, not public, uh, excuse oh. me. And, but I did want to mention an important event today was that, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Puxatawney Phil did see a shadow. Oh. Uh, which, tell uh, us, means six more we weeks of winter, but anyone familiar with our climate here in Tompkins County realizes it's 12 more weeks. Yes, I think you're <laughs> correct in that. Um, and I believe that Groundhog Day, the movie, is playing at the state. Oh either Ooh. tonight or tomorrow. Tonight at 7 o'clock. Yeah, so if you haven't seen that movie, it's really an excellent movie, so. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. My wife hates it. <laughs> We're not going. <laughs> not going, yeah. I think it's also on Netflix if you don't want to go out. Um, okay. Um, let's do the minutes of January 5th. Can I have somebody move those, please? Dan, seconded by Rich. And um, even though you weren't here at that meeting, Susan, you are allowed to vote on a minute's approval. Required to vote. Required to vote. Any changes or additions or comments? All right. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. First vote. All right, good job. <laughs> um, we also have a couple advisory board appointments. Let's see. Um, Tompkins County Public Library Board of Trustees, Jason Moore, Shelley Wong, and Nina Schultz. Um, they are all returning members to the board. And then Tompkins County Historical Commission, Marsha Lynch. Questions or comments? Oh, somebody move those. Rich moves, seconded by Mike. All in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous. <clears throat> All right, let's turn it over to Jay Franklin. Talk to us about assessment. Welcome. Thanks, I'm gonna try to share my screen here and do a short little presentation just to keep me on track. For the mood light. <laughs> ah, 
But um, I wanted to bring this to, you atten to your attention as I normally do now each year to uh, go over our results of our 2023 annual equity maintenance program. Uh, on February 10th, we'll be sending out um, assessment change notices. Uh, stagger in those mailings so that we can handle all the phone calls that we're anticipating. And for the next two months or so, we'll be in informal assessment review meetings. Um, having a good time. But I just wanted to touch base kind of on who we are. Most of you know, uh, our viewing public may not, but we're unique here in New York State. We're the only true countywide assessing unit um, in all of New York State. Nassau County does have a countywide assessing unit, but they do still have some village and city assessors that also do the same job that the county is doing at the same time. And I'll has a, a slide in here just to show you how confusing that is. But when we went to a county uh, charter, um, they put the consolidation of uh, the assessment function into that charter, not as a way to save money, but as a way to increase the service to the residents of Tompkins County. There was about 20 part-time assessors. Um, a lot of them were elderly and wanted to retire. So they were able to hire five full-time appraisers under uh, the guidance of Tom Payne. And one of those full-time appraisers was my dad as well. So there's been a Franklin in that office for 53 and a half out of our 54 years. So um, for what that's worth, whether that's a positive or negative, we'll see. But, um, but I am the uh, director of assessment for the county. I am the assessor for the county, but I also do all of the functions that the normal county real property tax director do, does. Um, oddly enough, this was more applicable a couple years ago, but even though I am an assessor, I sit with the real property tax directors. So I'm a chair of their legislative committee and a past president of that organization. So why, why do we do this? Why do we go and monitor our role and make sure everyone, everything is assessed equitably each and every year? And the main reason is because it's the law. Um, we don't get to choose and pick which sections of the law we want to administer, but section 305 of the real property tax law just says that all real property in each assessing unit shall be assessed at a uniform percentage of value. So we could pick 1%, 50%, 100%. You know, I say this every year, I was a math major at SUNY Binghamton. I don't know how to get to 6% of value unless I get to 100% first and take 94% off. So why would I wanna do more work? And you know, the real property tax is Latin for according, um, is an ad valorem tax, so it means according to value. So that's why we redo this every year because value changes. You know, so why do we do it? The main reason is to be as transparent as we can possibly be. Um, if we were to assess at a fractional level of assessment, we could make changes to people's value without notifying them of that change. And also because it's simply the right thing to do. You know, you don't have to pay income taxes at an income that you had years in the past. You don't pay sales tax on what you bought in years in the past. So everything that you, the other taxes that you pay are all based upon your current year. So your property's value should also be based upon the current year. But here's that transparency. This is from Nassau County and also the city of Glen Cove. So in 2019, the assessment for this house was $675, but they assess at 0.1% of value. So when you take 675, divide by 0.1, you come out to a fair, val or a fair market value of 675. But Nassau County is also saying, but this house is worth 711,000. So they are saying we are under assessing you by $36,000 each year or for that year. They have transitional assessments on where they can only phase in values. I, I can't explain this. And even more confusing is when you get to 2021, 2022, the county had, in 2021, the county has this property valued at $732, which translates to a market value of 732. But the city of Glen Cove has an assessment of 619,000, but they assess at 95%. 
they're a 95 county, 0.1%, so I don't want you to get confused there. So that comes out to a market value of 651,000. So the county's saying you're worth 732, the city's saying you're worth 651. Two assessors doing the same thing, coming out with different values for different purposes. Not the most transparent, and the general public can't understand that because I can't understand this. And I've been doing this for 26 years. So it's just easier, what is your assessment? Could you sell it for that? No need to go to a formula, no need to do any other manipulations. It's just there. But what if? What if back in July when I came to yeah, you? Hang on, hang on, Mike? Yeah, I just wondered, uh, like in Nassau, what would their uh, uh, dollars per thousand be? I know ours is, what, four or five? Yep, you'd be up into the thousands for a tax rate. I thought with something that small. Yep. And I, I have a slide kind of to show what happens as you move around assessments along with tax rates. But back in July and August, I came to you and said, I don't know if we're gonna be able to get this done. And then I went back and we said, we gotta figure out a way because we, we can't go to fractional assessments. It's, it's just wrong, it's not transparent, it's confusing. So, but what if we did, what would have happened? What would have happened is we would have reduced our level of assessment from 100% to 90%. And what that means is if your house was worth 200,000 on the 22 assessment roll, it would now be worth 222,222. You take 200,000 divided by that level of assessment, divided by 0.9, and that's how you come out. So we could have changed the vast majority of everyone's value without changing their assessment and without notifying them of that change. Not transparent. But in addition, some properties may have seen an increase in their assessment. So if you were worth 300,000 in 2022, and now you're worth 360 in 2023, we would have to increase your assessment to 324,000 in order to get to that market value of 360. So 324,000 divided by 0.9 comes out to 360. But then some properties may have seen a decrease in their assessment, but an increase in their market value. So if you were worth 300,000 in 2022, but now you're only worth 310, we would have sent you a decrease in assessment down to 279, but that would have increased your value to 310. It's, impossible to explain that. It's just not, we, we, we did it once back in 2006 and seven, and we, we didn't want to do it. And I have to thank Irene for trying to figure out a way to get this done and be transparent. But in addition to this, the majority of our commercial properties probably would have saw an assessment reduction by 10%. You know, if you were worth three million last year and you're an office space, you're probably just worth three million again this year. So we would have had to drop the assessment to 2.7 million so that that assessment at 90% is worth three million. Is everybody equally confused? Yes, thank you. Perfect. It's a little early for math, yes, but that's, you know. That's exactly what I was trying to get across is that <laughs> it's just not. I, I, I don't understand it. <clears throat> you know, I've been in this field 27 years and I still haven't found a good excuse as to why an assessor would want to do this. I know some reasons, but to me, none of them are good. What are, Go ahead. What are the reasons? <laughs> why do they do this? Because it makes no sense to me either. Yeah, well, one, it's a lot of work. Well, yeah, but what are the to positive reasons? Um, are you trying to hide the I, full value? There, that, that would be one, because you can change everyone's value by just changing that level of assessment. So you don't have to notify anyone of that. And if you have an assessment of $671, how many people in the public are gonna look at that and say, I'm overassessed? They have to go and figure out what the level of assessment is, translate that into a value, and it's just confusing. The only one reason and why you would do that is if we still had the eligible funds veterans exemption and that, uh, that takes a fixed dollar amount off of your assessed value. And if you're at a fractional value, it's not reduced by that percentage. 
but most of our eligible fund veterans um, have transferred over to the alternative veterans exemption, so it's not re really relevant to us here. Mike? Yeah, isn't it, is it still the case that a lot of these uh, assessing units that haven't assessed, re, re, uh, revalued for years and years, it's the, the newer property owners are paying a bigger share of the taxes than the, uh, the older uh, properties that haven't been reassessed? Um, somewhat, but I think also the higher priced properties would be under assessed than the lower priced properties because the higher priced properties appreciate at a higher level than the lower priced properties. So if you don't reassess, there's a tendency for the more well-off to benefit at the expense of the less well-off. And you, you've seen that in, you know, you could, um, the city of Detroit is probably the biggest example of that. And where if you don't annually adjust values correctly, the more, the more well-off neighborhoods benefit from that. So what we're doing increases fairness across the board. Correct. This, the annual reassessment program is the most fair way to value properties and to equitably distribute the tax burden. The International Association of Assessing Officers um, wholeheartedly agrees with that. And that's, that's the, the cycle that they would prefer is to do it annually. So how, how do we do what we do? So this year was a little bit different. Um, we took a look at our assessed value to sale price ratio. That tells us how our assessments are comparing to those sale prices. When that ratio is above one, we're over assessing. When that ratio is below one, that means we're under assessing. So this year when I ran those numbers, I saw numbers that I've never seen before. That the market was appreciating so much by July 1 of 2022. So I wasn't comfortable just looking at those and saying, let's apply a trend. So I put um, Irene and Vang Zyrath to the task of let's go out and sample all of these neighborhoods that we have just to see if that trend is actually correct or not. So we went out and we reappraised about 10% of each neighborhood. Um, and then we took a look, or then I took a look at what were our percentage increases on those new appraisals. Were those in line? Were they consistent? And could we then apply a trend across that neighborhood and be confident of that trend? Or did we need to go out and reappraise all of those because it was not a um, homogeneous neighborhood? We just couldn't see that the same increase was applying to all those parcels. So um, once we did that, you know, we were either able to a trend or we went out and reappraised. After we trended all of those parcels, we brought that back and then we did a parcel by parcel review of all of those trended values, just to make sure that there wasn't something unique about that property that we knew about that we didn't want it to, to, to trend up. So um, one thing that we will be including again this year is our assessment disclosure uh, impact notices. And one question I got last year was how did we create the tax estimates for those future years? And this is just kind of a snapshot of how we did that. So last year we took the 2021 assessment and the 2022 tax levy that was on the 2022 tax bills. So the tax rate is simply the tax levy divided by the tax base times 1,000. So that's where the 2022 tax rate came from. And that's the number that we saw on all of our tax bills. So then for 2022 assessment, I took a look at where our tax base was. I subtracted out a figure that I thought we would lose during the informal assessment review hearings because I don't want to uh, underestimate what the tax rate would be. I'd, I'd rather err on the side of it being higher than what it actually would be. So with, you know, in Caroline, with a new tax base of 295 million, we were able to estimate an assessment disclosure rate of $5.88. So what that says is the town of Caroline could have decreased, could decrease their tax rate to 5.88 and still generate that 1.734 million tax levy. So here was our actual assessment disclosure notice from last year. 
This was a parcel in the city of Ithaca. It increased from 650,000 to 680,000. And based upon those tax calculations showed a $404 estimated decrease in their taxes. Or really that's what would have happened in 2021 if everybody's 2022 values were in place. But what really happened? Well, the county had a 0% tax levy change. And based upon our formula for apportioning that tax rate, our tax rate for the city of Ithaca went down to 5.654303. The city of Ithaca had a 9.7% increase in their tax levy. So their tax rate, which could have dropped to 11.09 to generate the same amount as they did last year, actually increased up to 11.98. The Ithaca City School District had an 8.5% increase in their tax levy. And their tax levy could have dropped almost a dollar to generate the same $95 million or so that they generated last year. But their tax rate for 2022 actually came out to the exact same tax rate out to the sixth decimal point. Yeah out to the sixth decimal point in order to generate the amount of money that they needed to provide their services for their students. So what actually happened to this parcel? The county taxes went down to 38.45. You know, that was up $85 or so, a reduction over what could have been if tax levy stayed the same. Uh, the city of Ithaca, the taxes went up to 8146. ICSD 11450, total taxes 23441. So if all of the tax levies would have stayed the same, this parcel would have seen a $400 decrease in their taxes. But because of the increase in the levies by the city and the Ithaca Consolidated School District, taxes actually went up on this parcel by about $1,200. And just for clarity, on your graphic on the left, where it says town, it should say city? Correct. Okay. Yes, and I, I lived this. Yes. <laughs> and <we're, laughs> we lived it too after people got their ICSD tax bills <laughs> and their city tax bills, and it became apparent that <clears throat> I don't think a lot of people know how to create a tax levy. Yeah. So, sidebar, let's go there. Um, when I sent out our uh, newsletter a couple weeks ago, I had the percentage increases of all of the tax levy and the questions I got from the public and the questions that I got from town board members kind of made me think that people don't know this. And, you know, I can understand, you know, this is what I live, so I can, I, I know it, but I think I need to do a better job of trying to help explain this. So the tax rate is really just made up of the tax levy and the tax base. So my office determines the value of all the real property in the county. The taxing jurisdictions determine how much money that they need to do their services. One, an increase in one does not mean an increase in the other. They're two totally unrelated, uncorrelated variables. The only time they come together is when we create a tax rate. And the property tax, it's worth noting, is the tax of last resort. So when the county looks at their budget, they look at how much federal aid we're gonna get, how much state aid we're gonna get, what other grants come in. We put a sales tax estimate in as what we think that's gonna be. We have our fees and fines and other sources of revenue. And at the end, when we don't have any more money coming in, the last way for us to raise our money is through that property tax. So that's what I say is the tax of last resort. So what would happen? What happens when the tax base changes? So the first column is the base. With a tax base of $1 billion, a tax levy of $5 million, you get a tax rate of $5 per thousand. If your assessment's at two hundred fifty, dollars your taxes are gonna be twelve fifty. dollars Now, if we were to double everyone's assessment, the tax base goes to $2 billion, but the tax levy can stay the same. There's, there's no need to spend more money to generate more just because everyone's house is worth more. So because of that, we can take the five million, divide it by two billion tax base, multiply times a thousand, we get a tax rate of 250. Because we doubled everyone's assessment, that 250 assessment goes to 500,000, and whoa, lo and behold, the taxes are the same at 1250. 
Now, if we were to cut everyone's assessment in half, and this could be a way, let's value at 50% of value. So we go from a, a billion dollars to a $500 million tax base. Tax levy is still the same. Cut value, that doesn't affect the services that the county, the school, the town provides. Tax rate would then double. Five million divided by 500,000 times 1,000 comes to $10. Because we cut everyone's assessment in half, the 250 goes to 12, uh, 125,000, and taxes are the same. So as long as everyone is assessed at that uniform percentage of value, we can move that around and it doesn't change everything. But if we change the other variable, if we change that tax levy, so we're gonna keep the tax base the same at one uh, billion and the assessment the same at 250. <coughs> But if that levy goes from 5 million to 6 million, the tax rate rises in order to generate that extra 1 million. And now those taxes on that $250,000 house goes up to 1,500. If the tax levy goes down by a million, the tax rate can drop. And then the taxes on the $250,000 house is only at $1,000. My office is more than happy to take responsibility for any assessment on that role. If we're wrong, we'll fix it. We'll work with the property owner and make it right. But my office cannot be responsible for taxes. And I think we're, I'm, I'm trying to be a little more vocal on this. You know, we're more than happy to take that responsibility, but we, we can't take responsibility when taxing jurisdictions try to hide their tax levy increases in a tax rate discussion. So I really appreciate that the county always talks about what their tax levy goes up. That's, I'm, woohoo, love it, thank you. <laughs> so off the sidebar, kind of back <laughs> into the presentation. So. Um, starting February 10th, and I put the schedule on where the mailings are going to go out on your desk today. Um, so starting February 10th, we're going to mail out the city, Caroline, and Danby. They'll have about a week to review that, schedule any informal assessment review hearings with my office, and then there's three weeks for them to schedule. We will be posting all of those values um, on for even the towns that we aren't mailing out on February 10th. So if it's not your time to come in and talk to us, it could be your time to submit information to us. You don't need to wait. You can submit it online, submit it on a form that we'll have posted on our webpage, however someone wants to get it to us. Uh, this year, all of our uh, reviews will, done, will be done by a phone appointment. You just call up. And we found phone appointments have been good for us just because it, the meetings are so quick. They're five, 10 minutes long. It's very hard to get people into our office, have them wait when we only have two chairs in our front office and we have six, seven, eight meetings going on at once and then you're cycling through another group of property owners every 10 minutes. There, we, there really wasn't any benefit to that. There wasn't any benefit to making people come down, pay for parking and just be in and out. Um, so what we'll do is, um, when we review and we meet with that property owner, if we don't think we're gonna end up changing that assessment at that point in time, we'll send out the comparables that we use. I know at the end I said maybe we'll wait until May 1 when we send it out. Trying to match the comparables with a change notice, that just isn't gonna work. So at the time that we're meeting with the person, we'll say, hey, we'll send out these uh, either the comps that we use, the three to five comps, or we may say, here's all of the comps in your neighborhood. Take a look at these sales and let us know what you think. You know, here's all of them and here's the three that we used. If we're wrong, let us know. And then at the end, when we're done, what I always do is I plot everybody that came in. You know, I don't want 10 people on um, Queen Street to come in and we reduce their value, but the one house that didn't come in, we didn't reduce their value. So we wanna make sure that everybody gets the same treatment and not just those squeaky wheels. And then on May 1, we'll be sending out those tentative change notices from there. But I always get asked, what's gonna happen in 2024? I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I, I thought the market was turning. I thought the market was going down. Now I kind of see it kind of leveling off. 
and not really depreciating at all. Um, but we have so many variables acting either as a positive or a negative to value. There's a low supply of uh, for sale housing in the county. You know, I said it last year, we're just not building houses at a, any sort of rate to match that demand. Basic economic law, um, interest rates, where is that gonna go? Interest rates were climbing, you know, up to the mid sixes, maybe higher sixes, and now they're down around six the last time I checked. Um, one thing, the life cycle of housing has stopped. If you refinance during COVID and got a 3% interest rate, you're not really interested in going and getting a 6% interest rate now. You'd rather just stay in your house, but that stopped more houses being for sale. So that caused less uh, supply. We still have that same demand. It's still causing that increase in value. And you know, I spend a lot of time reading about real estate and that's really what I do. It's, I don't know, I, I, uh, TV is either on HGTV or ESPN or the Golf Channel. <laughs> it's just one of those three, depending if there's live sports on, it's there, but if not, it's HGTV. But, and for every article I see that the housing market is crashing, there's another one that says it's rebounding. And th there's no way that any of these articles really can tell us what's happening because there's too many generalities. You're looking at different markets. Nobody could even say that between the many different markets that we have in Tompkins County here. So the none, tr no trend could apply to everything here in our market. So I don't know how they could say what's gonna happen in the nation, but sorry for that. I probably went too long, but <laughs> I think it was important to try to get some of that across here. So no, honestly, have any questions? That's a, that was a great presentation. And I'm gonna suggest that all of our colleagues go and, and listen to this because every time you talk, I learn something mm -hmm. new and, um, there was a lot of good explanations in this, so thank you. Um, questions, Mike. Uh, I agree, uh, Amanda, that was very good and I'm, I hope other people will listen to it. It's taken a long time for me to kind of feel comfortable with this whole issue, but every time uh, Jay gives us a refresher, I, uh, I learn something also, but uh, Jay, you talked about trying to be more aggressive in getting the understanding about the tax levy out there. Uh, I'm totally behind you on that. I can still remember back when I was in village government, we always talked about tax rate. And that's still what a lot of the towns do, a lot of the, and, and the city does. Uh, it was, and what we did at the county when I first came on, we talked tax rate. Uh, you know, did the tax rate go up, tax rate go down, what happened this year? And then we started, uh, I think we were listening to our assessors saying you should be talking about tax levy because that's the actual amount of money that you're taking from the real property taxpayers. And uh, we started talking tax levy and that's where we are, thank goodness. But you really gotta educate the town board members, the village trustees and the city council people. And, you, and also the media because we see school these- board. Ah, School board, good point. Uh, thanks, Rich. The uh, school boards, the, the media just takes it when the, there's a press release or a comment from a supervisor or something like that saying our tax uh, rate went down or our tax rate went up, just a small amount. And they never go the next step and say, yeah, but what happened to the levy? And so I think if we really want to be transparent countywide with taxing, real property taxing, uh, we really have got to get those folks to understand, to talk about the tax levy. And, and, and remember, when we have a tax cap, it isn't on the, uh, on the tax rate, it's on the uh, levy. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting distinction that most people don't know. Rich and then Dan. Yeah, this isn't really a question, it's more in the nature of whining, and so I'm sure you're all <laughs> glad that I'm back on GO, but um, as elected leaders, we talk a lot about the importance of housing, and so do other elected leaders and other governments, and when you saw what happened this past year in the city of Ithaca and the impact on housing, everybody who rents, that cost has to be passed on to them. For, for a landlord, this is just math, that you have a calculus of what it costs to operate the property, you're gonna pass on that tax increase to your tenants, and that increase 
the cost of housing for the large majority of people, I think it's 80% of the people in the city, got a tax increase without even knowing it. It's called rent. Um, and when you do this, you also impact developers that we continually have this conversation about the number of people who commute into Tompkins County to work every day. And the number that I think is out of date was 15,000 people commute in every day. I don't know what it is now, but it's a positive number that come here to work. And it's because we, in part, because we don't have enough housing. Some people want to live somewhere else, and that's fine, but it's also that there isn't enough housing. And from a development standpoint, when you increase the tax burden, you make it more difficult to develop property, that it's just not as attractive a financial proposition to build a new house or an apartment building. And we seem to talk about housing and completely ignore this impact that we're creating. And I would uh, pat ourselves on the back a little bit in that we did not raise taxes this year. I can't tell you how many people complained about their taxes, and I had to say, but not the county. And we consciously did that, and Dan, thank you for your ending resolution to our budget pr process every year to bring us back into line. And our rationale for doing that was specifically that this is not the time to create that kind of financial burden on people. I mean, not just housing, but coming out of the pandemic, we want to have economic activity. We want to have people with resources to get back into the swing of things. We did a good job. You know, maybe people can criticize us for other reasons, but not that. And I wish that we had a more concerted approach all across all of our governmental units to think on this line that there are secondary impacts of just saying, well, we need the money to run the services we want to run. I'll stop. Thanks. It's good to have you back, Rich. <laughs> Dan. Thank you, Rich, for that <laughs> comment. Um, I have a comment and a question. So um, first of all, I pay a lot of attention to the tax rate, tax levy thing, and I'm always trying to explain this to people. But the tax rate, we shouldn't totally dismiss it. It actually does matter a little bit. I think the county is at something like eight years in a row running of lowering the tax rate. That's a, that is something to be proud of. It's not the only thing, it's, and it may maybe not the most important thing, but it is important itself. And what I usually tell people is, if your assessment didn't go up and the tax rate goes down, you're getting a ref, you know you're going to get a discount. So that's why it's important. Okay, question time. Um, county did not raise its tax levy the last two years in a row, and. Uh, Last year when I got my tax bill, I was kind of like happy, eager to get it. And I looked and I saw that my actual dollar figure that I paid went down. And I, I did something brave and I posted it on Facebook. Like, you know, I know this <laughs> inviting a lot of negative comments, but it was pretty good. And it was pre I learned some stuff too about how some people's didn't go down. Doesn't matter. My, my dollar amount actually went down. This year I got my tax bill, did the same thing. My, my tax bill went up. And it went up because my town tax went up and because I got reassessed. And, it's all good, you know, it's, it's, that's how we figure this out. My question, when I looked at this tax bill this year and I was like, well, how do I tease out how much of that increase I'm paying is the county amount and how much is the town amount, I realized I can't do it. And I'm wondering why can we put on the tax bill, you know, the, the, of, of the $2,500 you're paying, $1,700 is your town and $800 is the county or whatever. Is that possible? That's exactly what we do. Um, there, there is a uh, line on the tax bill for each uh, tax levy on there. So typically the first line is the county tax. We put the current um, tax levy. We put the percentage change of the tax levy from previous years and then we put the taxable value tax rate and then what those taxes are. Typically the next one would be the town and then if you have any special districts, water, fire, solid waste annual fee. Uh, you're right, I'm sorry, I, I asked the wrong question. Uh, it says what the percent change from last year is in the county tax or the town tax. But it doesn't tell the dollar amount that you paid last year. 
So that's why I, I can't compare it unless I go find my tax bill, which is why not too many people responded to my Facebook post because no one was looking at their last year's tax bill. I'm sorry, so that was my actual question. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we could, but it wouldn't be for every parcel because I would, as long as your parcel didn't change, the parcel number didn't change, I could go back and take a look at what those were. Um, it would make the bill a little more complicated. I'm dealing with multiple files and tax time is already the worst time of the year for me. Starting from November through Christmas, like Thanksgiving, I trying to coordinate the towns getting me data, their bookkeeper, the county, it's always fun. So matching more together, I mean, we, we could do that, um, I, I, I wonder if there's better ways of doing that. Um, so let, 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 let me think about that. You know, if, if your parcel is subdivided, I'd have no way to go back and saying if it was consolidated, um, it may look like it went up a lot more because you're not including two parcels into that one calculation. So it's, it's not a perfect system. Um, let, let, let me think about it. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Just, you know, just to, I'm, I'm, I guess, I, just to be clear what I'm, what my issue was or whatever my thought was is that, um, you know, my, it, I, I'm looking at my tax bill here. That's why I'm staring at my phone. It says, um, you know, 0% change from last year for the county tax. I'm like, oh, cool. But um, it wasn't a zero change in my dollar, and I don't know what that change is. So that's all. That's all I was trying to get across. Yeah, the, Thank the, you. the, the county tax calculation is, I don't want to say complicated, but it's also affected by the sales tax offsets as well. Yes. So even though the county overall tax levy didn't change, it actually went down by $1,600 or something like that. Um, but when that's, those taxes are apportioned by the overall value of the different towns and then the sales tax offset could change as well, the tax rates for the towns, some may actually go up for the county and some may go down. Um, it, it, there's a lot of more factors kind of working in on that. That's why there's never really one county rate. There's 16 county tax rates that we have. And I, I always try to tell people, don't just look at your county rate because of those sales tax offset. You know, the county rate's your left pocket, your town rate is your right pocket. And just because of where those sales tax are, one rate may be higher than the other rate. But when you look at them combined, then you get a better picture because you're, you're more looking at apples to apples, you know, maybe varieties of apples as opposed to apples and oranges. All right, well, we should probably move on unless there's any I other last questions. Quickie, Mike? I apologize for asking twice, but I just wanted to say that this discussion, I wish we could go on because it really brings together all of the problems. It's gentrification in the city of Ithaca. It's forcing people out and raising the assessments in the, uh, in the towns and villages. It's increasing the use of our highways coming in from out of county. Uh, and it's affordability for families. It's, it's forcing more people to stay in, uh, in apartments. Maybe they don't want to be in apartments. Uh, so I'm glad we've got a, a housing committee this year. And I hope they're going to be looking at some of those issues, such as how do we get more single-family houses, which we haven't had, uh, which is the part of our housing study that hasn't been addressed. Yeah, I agree, Mike. I think this is a good discussion. And thank you for being here, Jay. And will you send us the slides from? Yes. Yep. yep. And then my other question was, um, we have the, I forget what it's called, the Gov delivery newsletters, the assessment department has one, right? Yes, yep. yeah. yeah I, I try putting it out every two weeks. Yeah. Sometimes I do slip into that third week because I realize, oh, sh it's Thursday all of a sudden and I want to get it out on Friday. So, you know, I, I, I do get that out. And, and that's kind of where I, I wanted to talk about that tax rate discussion yeah. is I had a lot of members of the public and town board members um, come to me and say, hey, could you explain this? And then light bulbs went off. So right. we'll be putting more and more information out there. And you know, That's great. I mean, it, and if we can been great. get more of the public to sign up for that newsletter, I think that would be great because 
that's a place for you to talk directly to folks. So. I'll say the last time that I talked to Dom, I think my newsletter was the highest subscribed newsletter. All right, so. congratulations. No. <laughs> Crown jewel of newsletters. Yeah, people must like taxes, so. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for being here. Thank right. you for a good discussion. We appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you next time. Great. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. one more thing. Yeah. Postcards. Oh, yeah. The uh, low-income senior postcards that we sent out. I'm changing my mind. They were a good idea. <laughs> um, expensive. Probably we could have done them better targeting, but our phones have been off the hook. We're getting more seniors signed up for this. It's yeah. been great. You know, I hear that across through other towns as well. Their phones have been getting hammered through other different assessing units. So it, it's really good. Even though this notice is on every tax bill that everybody gets, by putting it in front of them, we're getting more people signed up. And that's, it, it costs a lot. We could have done yeah. it better but hey, we'll do it, we'll get what we can, and we'll get people signed up. So I Great. Good changed update. my mind. Thanks. I got two of them, <laughs> and um, I don't qualify, but uh, I, I do think it was a good idea. Yeah, yeah we, the vendor we used tried to match addresses so that not multiple went out. So probably some went through. Just the tax bill program that we use from New York State is so antiquated and not always good with addresses. So. A, I'd, I'd, I'd rather you get two than none. Yeah, Rich. I just wanted to say I was talking to a senior who came into your office and spoke very highly of the service they got. I, yeah. My front office, I love them. Tammy, Amy, and our new Kaylin, great. So, Excellent. thank you. Well, thank you all for the work you do. Thanks, take care, have a good day. Okay, um, let's invite Steve and Alana to come on up. From Board of Elections, we have a resolution here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay, let's go ahead and move that resolution. <coughs> Excuse me, acceptance of grant funding, technology, innovation, and election resource, tier grant. ID 11462. Can somebody move that? Rich, seconded by Mike. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. What do you want to tell us about this grant? Uh, well, it's one of several grants that we've gotten over the last few years from uh, through the New York State government that has been administered by the New York State Board of Elections. And essentially, the, this resolution is just a a formality. Uh, we applied for the grant. Uh, you know, they told us how much the dollars would be. We applied for it. They uh, signed off on it. The OGS did, and so now before we make claims, uh, we just want to have a have you guys, uh, you know, approve receiving the, the money. Great questions, comments. What are we going to spend it on? Oh, a variety of things that it's it's used to it's the purposes for administering uh, elections and uh, we've got some uh, is uh, buying new equipment uh, we uh, purchased a few few more uh, I think four more uh, electronic poll books to use during early voting we purchased uh, um, some scanners uh, for to use in the office, uh, a new printer the, to uh, replace a printer in our office that's been there for 15 to 20 years. Uh, and uh, there's some of the money will come uh, from uh, is money that IT has spent to make uh, elections more secure. Uh, that benefits the county also because it makes the county more secure. Um, thanks. All right, we're ready to vote. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. It's always good to be accepting money. Um, any other updates while you're here or questions from committee members about what's going on in Board of Elections? Mike? And Susan? Thanks for certifying our new uh, 
<laughs> legislator so quickly. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say thank you for, um, uh, you know, the, the early voting. And January 24th was a really cold, gray day. And so thank you, the poll workers, too. I really appreciate what, all the work that you did and answering all my questions. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we, we definitely appreciate the poll workers who, um, you know, are out there throughout all the early voting, and it's, it's a lot of time. Rich? I saw a news article regarding a potential change in the way the city is treating its um, vacancies and um, trying to consider going to elections instead of appointment, and I would certainly support that. I, um, I guess we, at some point, should hear a little bit more about any logistic issues that would cause for you guys. Well, I uh, did send a, um, an email to Robert Cantalmo, who's moving this within the city, and because uh, I think that the election we just had in the third district would kind of mirror uh, if an older person position uh, became vacant. And, you know, I just outlined to him that uh, the uh, cost for the poll workers and uh, for that election and our uh, technicians, neighborhood of $12,000. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the, what I'm hearing is they say that it's, you know, it's more democratic uh, and it's more transparent. And I would argue that I'm not sure that it's more transparent. I think what people fail to realize is that uh, uh, special elections come up uh, unexpectedly a lot of the times. I mean, a lot of times it's when somebody gets elected to a higher position and you're filling a vacancy, so you get a little bit of notice. Sometimes somebody <clears throat> abruptly resigns. And what the people don't realize is the political calendar, the, the ballot access for the candidates starts at the moment that the proclamation is made for the special election. And that process lasts about 10, 10 days to two weeks. And if you're not ready, uh, <laughs> or, you know, uh, if like this year when Henry Grandison resigned, uh, his original date that he wanted to resign, uh, the ballot access process would have been starting around the 1st of November. and. Uh, <laughs> You know, right as we're leading up to the midterms, I just don't know how how transparent that is for and, and how that helps get your candidates on there. Whereas, you know, you have a process that the city just went through where they had eight candidates, they vetted them and they interviewed them and they discussed them and you know, uh, and uh, they make an appointment. It's good until the next November election, and you know, if they got it wrong, okay. But it's, uh, uh, a lot of times these elections, particularly in the city, are unopposed. I don't I can't remember the last time we had an, you know, you know uh, older person position that was opposed in the city. It's, uh, I, everything you say, I, I think, are real issues. Um, I guess that beyond the logistics and the cost that I think there's something really important about the psychological process of having a candidate wander in the wilderness <laughs> and understand that they, they owe the, their allegiance to voters, not to other legislators. I think you change the dynamic pretty significantly if you're saying, oh, you guys around here gave me this position, that, and, and I, I'm troubled by that. I think this would be a significant improvement in the city if, if they adopt it. Um, but that's up to them. But I, and I guess well, we just facilitate if they do. And I think if you take this to it, to what could be a, a logical but probably not probable conclusion, well, if every municipality in the county passed a similar one, we would be running pop-up elections all the time. I mean, right now you currently have a vacancy in the town justice in the town of Ithaca, in the town of Enfield. You have a vacancy for. Uh, that was just filled for council person in the uh, town of Dryden, and you uh, have uh, the, the one that just went through pr the process in the city of Ithaca. And 
Uh, they're all different time frames, and uh, you know. Uh, yeah, maybe there's a population threshold before you go to this. Right. Mike, I, I really don't think that would happen, Steve, because it's the it's the county and the city that have charters and can make changes, but the others are all uh, determined by state law and the processes under state law. That would be helpful then. <laughs> <laughs> and so what? The, uh, the vacancy, filling the vacancies are is set in, uh, in town law and, and village law and things like that. So you'd have, to, you'd have to get home rule legislation to change it. And I don't think, well, I, I'd be very doubtful that many towns and villages would want to go through that. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Good to see you both. <clears throat> and yeah. enjoy your afternoon. All right, let's do a couple of legislature resolutions. <clears throat> we have approval of appointment to the Tompkins County Council of Governments, um, ID 11465. Can somebody move that, please? Rich, seconded by Dan. And this would um, appoint Shauna Black to be a member and Dan Klein to be the alternate member. Questions or comments or concerns about Shauna and Dan? Mike? I would just like to hear from time to time what's going on in Council yeah. of Governments. We haven't had much feedback yeah. uh, recently. Yeah, good point, thank you. We will, um, maybe we can invite Shauna to a meeting, you know, partway through the year and get some updates and or Mr. Klein. Lisa, do you attend that as well? I do, and typically it's, um, it conflicts with the TCAT board meeting, so I attend the first 20 minutes, half hour or so, and then I have to hop off. I give a report and then I'm often off, so I can't really comment too much on what happens at the end of the meeting. Okay. Is there another staff person that attends? Um, I'm thinking maybe Bridget does, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else on this? We ready to vote? All in favor? <clears throat> That's unanimous, thank you. <coughs> um, okay, we have resolution, adoption of list of designated officers and employees required to file an annual financial disclosure form, ID 11460. Somebody like to move that. Mike, seconded by Rich. And this is, uh, as you know, just an annual listing of who has to file financial disclosure. Are there um, any changes this year? That was gonna be my question for either Brittany or Katrina. Is it the same? There were a couple, just updates. Okay. Questions? Mike? No. Oh, okay. I was just pointing at the microphone. <laughs> um, okay, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And then another um, annual resolution. Let's see. Where is it? Approval of the 2023 succession of members of the county legislature to serve in the absence of the chair and vice chair, ID 11464. Somebody move that, please. Rich, seconded by Susan. All right. Um, and this year we have listed Mike Lane, Mike Sig Sigler, and Rich John as um, our successors in case of um, Shauna and Dan being out of the country and indisposed. I'm going to try to eat right and exercise. Please do. <laughs> you're, you're fifth in line. I have no recollection of this ever actually having happened. Happened, yeah. Well, you're next in line, Mike, so you better take care, too. We're worried about the next one. <laughs> All right, we're ready to vote. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. I should point out that that's 
by seniority. Yeah. Yeah, by who has been here longest. Um, okay, moving along. So one of the things I wanted to do this year, and I wanted to do it last year, but I wasn't really very together, um, is just have some, we don't have to have a discussion, but I wanted to provide some more um, information and some of the rules from Robert's Rules and just a little bit maybe at each meeting. Um, it's a big book. I have one at home. This is Deborah's. Um, and mo a lot of it we follow with the legislature and some of the details we don't and that's okay too. And we also have our own rules um, that Susan, you will get a copy of. Um, you have a copy. and. You know, I think my thinking was to sort of pull out a couple of pages at every meeting that for, for you all to read, um, if you have questions or if you see something that you're like, oh, we don't do this, or this is confusing to me, or, you, you know, um, just to try to shine more light on our process. And um, this was kind of random. I thought I'd just sort of start at the beginning and talking about what is a main motion. So I tried to pull out a couple of pages that um, <coughs> talk about what a main motion is and how it works. And from my reading, I think we pretty much um, do this, but you know, it was just, just a way for us to learn a little bit more at each meeting. And certainly if folks have questions or comments, this would be a time to discuss. If there's nothing to discuss, that's fine too. But um, I did want to provide just a little bit of an educational aspect to our meetings. <laughs> so if there are questions or comments, I'm happy to, yeah, Mike. I think it's a nice idea, uh, Amanda. I think, uh, thank you for this. Uh, when I first came on the uh, Board of Reps years ago, the first thing they told me was get, get yourself a copy of the of the Robert's Rules of Orders, and I and I said which which version? Oh, any of them. <laughs> there, there's a lot of them out there. I've got a couple in my desk here. So, uh, but it's uh, I do find that when something comes up, it takes longer to to uh, try to look it up than it does to. Uh, by the time you've looked it up, we've already gone beyond it right. in, in our yeah. debate. Yeah, and I found, you know, even just <clears throat> looking at this one topic of what is a main motion, I mean, it's in several sections in the book. It's, there's not just one, you can't just read chapter 10 and learn everything. They, it's all split up. So it's, it's not necessarily a very organized book, but if you, if you know where to look, you can, you know, find the details. Um, other thoughts? Dan. I want to add the piece of trivia that General Robert uh, lived in Owego when he wrote this book. Please hold your applause till the end. <laughs> Owego, was a, Owego was a pretty prosperous little village years ago. Really was. Uh, if I can jump in, I yeah. do have some General Henry Robert trivia, which is that <laughs> in the military he traveled around the country, and at the time he did that, the West was getting settled, and people were coming in from all over the country and the world to these little communities and trying to hold organizational meetings to do all sorts of things. And what he found was chaos. And that's what drove him to say, okay, we need some uniform set of rules. And, and he then determined it was a paying gig. <laughs> <laughs> and his, I think his family still, mm. it's sort of a family business running all the updates to Robert's Rules. Mm. I can't imagine being that being one's job to update Robert's Rules, but I'm sure somebody has to do it. And, and I guess I would just add to Katrina and Taylor and Brittany, if you know, if there's things that we're doing wrong, or you want to jump in and add, or say, oh, you know, this is how we should do it, absolutely, you know, that's your job is to correct us. So, um, hopefully, my hope is just that this will be a chance for people to read more and ask any questions about, yeah, this. Mike? It's interesting that uh, Congress, they have a whole group of parliamentarians 
and you know, when a Congress, uh, a senator or a congressman wants to do something, they go to the parliamentarians and say, how do I get this done? And they say, well, you, you'd have to do this, 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 and this, or you can't do this. Our parliamentarian is sitting over here, our, our, <laughs> our county attorney, so. Yeah, and you know, definitely, um, I think there's things like other motions that we, we do always kind of say, well, what's a motion to rescind or what is tabling versus postponing? And so I think that, you know, will be good to sort of review as well going forward. Okay, yeah, Susan. I just wanted to say that, uh, thank you. I really appreciate this because even though I've had to, I've been in organizations where Robert's Rules of Order were required, the library, for example, it's been years, so um, this is it's still new to me. Yeah. So I'm going to be following your lead, and I apologize in advance for mistakes. <laughs> no worries, <laughs> no worries. We're all we all make mistakes, all and and again, you know, I think it's also good for all of us and all of our legislature colleagues to also review the rules of the legislature, which we we revised a couple of years ago, and. Um, anything in there sort of supersedes Robert's rules. So it's good to be um, up to date on what that says. Okay, well thank you for indulging me <clears throat> on that. Um, let's go ahead and, and talk a little bit about um, 2023 committee goals. I, I don't have any, um, well I guess I have a couple thoughts. Um, I can find a page. Um, I normally I would sit down with my vice chair and talk about um, what what are what are your goals for the year? What are my goals? What do you think the committee should work on? Susan and I haven't had a chance to do that, um, but maybe we will in the next month. Um, I think. With this committee, there's often things just get thrown at us and we have to deal with them. Um, and I think there's a couple things carrying over <clears throat> from last year, um, which include the advisory board process of review and the policy. Um, so hopefully we'll be seeing that come around um, and then in, in hopefully being able to support our clerks in getting some kind of new software or um, programs to help them with their um, management of advisory boards. So that's one thing that's on my mind. Um, and then of course supporting, we have a new clerk of the legislature, supporting her and um, all of our clerks is important. But if there's other things that you all feel like um, you wanna make sure we think about or discuss in the coming year, um, I want to hear from you. And then also we have this list from all of the departments that report to us that um, they have quite a bit going on and we want to support them in all of the things that they're doing and not be throwing ex too many extra things at them um, and maybe we can turn to Lisa also if uh, anybody can jump in but you know about other thoughts about administration goals and such so just open it up anybody wants to throw anything out there Dan thank you I've got uh, <clears throat> two comments or questions about the departmental goals um, one small, one a little bigger maybe. So let's start with the small one. It's on page four of the handout that we, that we got today. Under communications coordination, and it says executive order 18, plan implementation. Uh, I just thought we should put a little bit in there about um, what executive order 18 is. It has to do with domestic terrorism, but I don't know. It was new, I had, I had not, not heard the number before. I had to look it up. And... That's, that's fine. That's kind of our um, shorthand information. So that, that, thank you for pointing that out. The other one is on page two of the handout. It's number 12, unhoused population coordination. And um, it talks in there about 
Well, this is what it says. In 2023, this work will include integrating recommendations from the Tompkins County Continuum of Care Strategic Plan. So I, I feel like we have not adopted the recommendations of the Continuum of Care, and that really what that should say is considering recommendations from them instead of integrating. Um, that's just, you know, from my point of view, we haven't actually, like, voted on any of this stuff. <clears throat> and then at the end of that line where it says the strategic plan, I'm just not sure, I'm not sure that that's what they're calling it. Is there something titled a strategic plan? Because they have two things that we've gotten from them last year. There was the housing needs survey and then this thing called Tompkins Home Now or something like that. And th what they told we had a little meeting with them about this, and what they told us was that it's not a plan. They were very, it was important to them that they said it was not a plan. However, what I heard, what I just found out yesterday is that there is an updated thing that they have issued that I haven't even looked at yet. So maybe it's now it's a plan, I'm not really sure. So I just wanted to mention all that. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan, thank you for bringing that up because when you look at that word integrating, it also has the city's policies related to encampments. And right now, I'm not aware that the city has a policy, that they have, are developing it, they're about to announce. I don't think they actually have. So we don't know whether we want to integrate. Yeah. yeah. I, I uh, Point well taken. I think that the choice of the, the verb should be consider. Thanks. All right, Mike. This is a good one, uh, Dan, that you brought up to talk about a little bit. Uh, in the future, I, uh, for example, I, I don't know whether the homeless services coordinator, if that we create a position like that, should be in administration or ought to be in social services. I think uh, I've been kind of concerned that administration responsibility has been exploding with, with, with new positions that really could be handled in the departments. Uh, and. Uh, it means more for our administrator to do, more for the uh, uh, would, would more space requirements that we, we might not have in administration. And I just, I'm just concerned about the uh, expansion. Lisa? Thank you, Mike. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. Uh, um, and um, I don't know if now is the time to, to, to talk about it, but I did have that uh, conversation in trying to determine where this position in particular would fit, had the conversation with um, DSS Commissioner Kit Kephart, and really trying to drill down to um, what what is within the purview of our Department of Social Services when it comes to um, homeless services, and and came to the um, conclusion after that conversation that they are they are focusing on the individuals that um, that meet the criteria for their services. For those that don't, they are not mandated, so to speak, or are are serving them. So the, the role of this position I see is broader than that because there are many people that don't meet the, the criteria for services at DSS and we want to make sure that our umbrella is broad enough to meet that. So that was one reason. And then the second reason being that because the response to homelessness involves multiple departments, planning, the sheriffs, et cetera, that it would take a department that was in a in a position like administration to coordinate and possibly direct the work of other departments, whereas one department is hard pressed to do that. So that's just a little bit of the, the reasoning behind. I was not looking for more work <laughs> for sure. Thank I would just, and I don't. I know we're talking about the goals. Yeah, no, that's I don't, fine. I don't really want to get into this, but I would be really concerned that this could explode into its own department. Uh, you know, how do we coordinate homelessness in in Tompkins County? I don't think we, at least I'm not 
interested in going down that path right away. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that other municipalities would love to have us do that uh, and be able to point at us and, and say, well, it's their fault, not ours. Um, and I, I just am very, very concerned here. So just as a reminder, this was a two-year OTR. This is far from a department yet. Maybe in 2025 we'll have this debate. But been here a while. I've watched these things happen <laughs> in the past. Rich, um, did you did you share a, a written list of what you proposed for priority? Okay. No, I did um, not. So maybe you could just update me. Back when I was on Geo, we were talking about addressing advisory boards and trying to streamline. And yeah, I, I, did you solve all that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> all done. Um, no, we, so let's see, where it is currently, what we decided to do was, um, with Kathy and Katrina, we revised the policy, the advisory board policy, and they really felt like by doing that, if, if the policy was in place, it would sort of, it would sort of um, address those issues, all the issues that they were having. And then we would give the advisory boards and departments you know, six months, nine months to then go back and revise their bylaws so that they could then sort of be in compliance with the policy, thus allowing the clerks to perhaps get um, a software program that would help them manage all the, the names and the terms and the addresses and all of that. So I think where we're at, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we did go through the policy that was sent to administration. It's in administration, so we're waiting for administration to go through that, talk to departments. I don't know. Kathy had talked to some departments. We, we did talk to departments. We talked to planning in particular. They right. had all, there was a number of comments from them, and I need to work with Bridget to update the draft policy that we had. Okay. It's on my list of things to do. Okay, so so we're in the revising of the policy. When you've done that, it'll come to this committee, and then we can offer further um, discussion. And then once the legislature approves it, then there'll be some more discussion with department heads and advisory boards on revising their bylaws. We're going to actually look into setting up like a bylaws template, right, for departments, right, and for the different boards and. I actually have a meeting this afternoon about software, meeting management software, and we're going to see what components can be included there for boards and commissions. And I think one of the big things that happened was that Brittany actually took all the names that were like in a Word document and put them into a spreadsheet, right? Yes, they're in an Excel document. And yes. It's a whole... Huge. Yes, that's, I mean... The, appoint, the reappointment process to do all those letters and stuff was just... Yeah. So thank you, Brittany, for yes, thank you getting much. that done. So my question then is, um, would it be helpful to you, you guys, if this was one of our priorities for 2023 to sort of provide oversight or view to this? And, and it is, it's one of our priorities for the department, too, for 2020. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 been a long pro. I mean, you yeah. were at the beginning of the process. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly, if you think that you'd be better off if we just stepped away, <laughs> I, I'd hope you'd say that to us. You know. Okay. Yeah, I think we're at at this point. We need the legislature needs to wait for the policy to come before us, and and then we can discuss it again and and go through you know any other questions or comments that we have. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I would like to see that move forward, but it's, you know, the, the, your timeline is your timeline, and we want it to be easier for you, but no pressure. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Other, other goals or um, thoughts for this committee or questions for administration about um, these or for our attorney about... Um, attorney goals for the year. Lisa? I just wanted to say um, th 
thank you. I think that what the, the discussion that we just had in the reference between committee goals and clarification, asking clarification of departmental goals um, from your perspective is exactly what I, we like to do in this process so that um, the department's administration is clear on the legislative directive and you're clear on what the, what the departments are doing. So thank you, I appreciate this discussion. Yeah, and, and again, like I don't particular, other than trying to educate folks on Robert's rules and, and dealing with anything that comes up, I don't have any particular special projects or goals for this committee. Um, but if any committee members, if something comes up and you want to you know, discuss a certain topic or you hear something that we need to, to bring up, certainly you know, let's, let's, let's add it to an agenda and um, discuss anything that comes up, so. And Susan and I will get together, and, and if you have other thoughts or goals, then you know we can add that to the list too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, moving right along. So last month, some of you weren't here, but um, Mike Lane brought up a discussion about weighted voting for the legislature, and you provided some information then. Um. Um, Basic calculations, yeah. Right, some numbers. You you asked me to uh, get <clears throat> some more information on what's happening with weighted voting in other counties and things. I frankly haven't done that research yet, so I would be just as happy to put this over to, to the next meeting if, if unless other folks would like to talk more about it today. Okay, all right. Um, I think I'll just reiterate what I said before. Um, I think the best way to do it is, yeah, if you, to share that information if, um, and then I think the committee needs to decide if this is something that the committee wants to pursue. If it is based on, you know, the sort of information that you have, Mike, we could then dig deeper into it um, and ask some, maybe our staff or our attorney to, to gather more information on top of that. Um, so I welcome other comments now or questions. Um, yeah, Rich. Just the definition, <laughs> is this w voting based on population of represent representatives? Yes, because uh, after, because we will not be uh, electing people in the new districts until 2025, and they won't be serving until 2026. Uh, and, uh, we are out of kilter there, particularly for the uh, some of the uh, more urbanized districts that increased in population, uh, and whereas some of the rural districts uh, decreased in population. So, you take my, I'll take my own example, um, where my population decreased mainly because of the issues with our dorms at TC3, but. My vote is now, the number of people in my district is, uh, I'm getting a full full vote for, and maybe I'm only entitled to uh, like 90, 94%, whatever the calculation was, I don't have it right in front of me. And some of the people down in Ithaca, uh, you know, they only get one vote, but their, uh, their population would give them about 1.2 or 1.3% of the vote. Um, I don't like weighted voting. I, I never have, but uh, I think we're, we, we need to look at it, uh, even if we have to hold our noses, because uh, the, it's taking so long to get the new districts in place. Yeah, and again, um, I, don't, I don't have that um, sheet that you handed out in front of me, Mike, last month, but um, I think some of the thoughts were that that those numbers are going to be changing on a regular basis. Um, no. Well, the w population changes all the time. I mean. Well, no, but, but it, it's based on the census. That's what we right. have to redistrict on. Right. Um, and I think Dan had a question last month of whether the fractional changes, would that even 
effect if one vote would, I don't remember how you said it, but would, but would having those fractional changes, would that actually affect any of our votes? I'm not saying it the right way, but. Yeah, whether even it's theoretically possible for that to affect the outcome, and I think the answer is yes. I, I figured it out afterwards. Um, yeah, Rich. Certainly representing one of the districts that's had probably most of the growth in the county because of the explosion of new development in the core. Um, I guess we should look at the numbers, but I'm skeptical it would be worth the cost in terms of logistic difficulty. But Mike, you raise a good point. Maybe we should look at it. Maybe it is so far out of whack. Um, but the idea of trying to vote by <clears throat> strange numbers and then trying to do the math on every single vote, oh my God. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I guess I shouldn't. Uh, I, I, I do know that in a lot of the counties that have weighted voting, that they vote just, uh, that they only do the weighted voting if somebody calls for it. Uh, oh. Like if it's a close vote or something. Um, kind of like turbocharging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, uh, there's gonna be a lot of opinions about it. I think that I would, I'll just reiterate what I think the process should be, is that this committee should decide if this is something that we actually want to pursue and consider um, and, and move forward with a resolution on at some point, or if, if this committee feels that that would be too onerous of a task or a process to, to, that we don't want to take that up, then we would not move forward with that. So. I guess I'll just look to you, Mike, to... Yeah, I'll, I'll get some more information on the other counties. Uh, uh, you take boards, uh, counties with boards of supervisors, they have to have weighted voting because they vote by towns, basically. Um, and you have different uh, populations in different towns. Uh, a number of years ago, when we were looking at Madison County, five of their supervisors could, by weighted voting, could make any decision, and I think they had 19... Uh, members at that time. Yeah, it would it would be a, a massive change and probably challenge. Um, okay, well, I will um, add that to next month and um, we'll yeah, go from I there. I apologize for not having more information, but I just, it's been yeah, a busy no, season. It's been busy, busy time. Any other thoughts or questions about that? Does that process feel okay to folks? Okay. All right, um, I do not have a report other than, once again, welcome to the, the new configuration of the committee. Um, County Administrator, do you have other updates for us? Um, just to say that next month we'll have a few HR policies for review and hopefully we'll have that agenda item back um, after further discussion with the State Department of Labor. Any questions for Lisa about that or anything? All right, Bill, any updates? Nothing other than probably what you know about already. We have a couple of issues percolating and I'm not comfortable right now speaking about it unless we go into executive session, so. Okay. But it, it's in hand. All right, questions for Bill. Um, let's see, I see Drew is up there. Any updates from the finance department? Hi, Drew. Good morning. Um, I am home recovering from some surgery, but I do have some nice updates for you. Um, we had a successful bond sale yesterday. We got a rate of about 3.25%. Um, you may have heard that the Federal Open Market Committee announced a quarter percent hike yesterday as well. So I was very happy to see these rates on the 20-year bonds. Our bands sold for around 3.5% net. So there's, there's a lot of calculations that go into those bond rates, but that's basically what the county will be ending up paying. Um, our office is still struggling um, with some of the vacancies. We're trying to meet deadlines the best we can, but um, we're, we're running a few weeks behind. So appreciate everybody's patience on that. Um, 
I'll be back in the office right now. The plan is for a few days next week as I recover probably part-time and working remote as well. So that's what I have. If anyone has any questions. Mike? Sure, we wish you well quickly and hope you get back soon. Yeah, uh, but thank you. I really wanted to thank you and, uh, and Dominic for the press release on the Moody's rating. Uh, you told us about it. Uh, but it, uh, it was out there in the media. I saw it in the Cortland Standard, and uh, it's a, a, a good thing in all the work that, that you did and you, your department, I know. And uh, it, it's, it's nice to blow our own horn. It is. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, definitely feel better soon and don't work too hard. <laughs> Um, any updates or topics from committee members today? All right. There is a budget adjustment for reference only. Any other questions or comments for the Crown Jewel Committee today? Best committee. All right. We're adjourned. Thanks for being here, everyone. Ha, ha, ha.